Hey everybody, it's Taylor Weeks. All right, so I know the turkey season is right around the corner and it's fast approaching. And trust me, we have some turkey content coming very soon for you guys. But we have an episode that we could not sit on until after turkey season. We wanted to go ahead and share this episode with everyone because we really think that you're gonna enjoy it. So if you have seen this deer on Facebook or online uh, in the past two years, then you already know a little bit about this deer probably. This deer was taken in Geneva at the WMA there by Mr. Gene Oglesby with help from his brother Riley. And we were fortunate enough to be able to sit down with them in Mr. Gene's home that he opened up to us and we got to talk deer hunting with them and they shared the story about how they took this deer. I hope you guys really enjoy this episode. As always, if you will, like, uh, subscribe, and please share it with a buddy. Share this podcast with a buddy. And with that being said, hope you guys enjoy this episode. Well, uh, so whenever we first started the podcast, this deer was one of the first ones that we said, we got to reach out to the guy that killed it and see if, if he would be willing to come on the podcast and share the story about it. And um, I remember looking through Facebook. I was trying to find the deer, and it is not hard to find the deer on Facebook still. <laughs> uh, it's all over the place. But um, anyway, we were really excited when I reached out to you, and, and you said you would be willing to do the podcast with us. And uh, took a little bit of scheduling to, to, to make it happen, yeah. but, but we're excited. And thank you for opening up your home to us to come in here and record, and, and uh, we're well, looking I'm forward to hearing the story. Always willing to share some time and definitely my home my space with uh, anybody that has a like interest in deer hunting is a uh, something that's in your blood it's mm-hmm. not it's not something you go to the store and buy it's uh mm-hmm. it's either in you or it's not that's right that's right i agree uh, I pull that mic up closer to your mouth if you don't mind figure all you guys are you uh, kindred spirits in the in the deer hunting world and uh we love it he actually wrote a poem years ago. I wish he'd brought a copy of it with him, but uh, there's something about deer hunting that you don't have to explain to another deer hunter, but you have no way of explaining it to someone who does not hunt. I agree mm-hmm. 100%. True. Absolutely. That's true. Yeah, I'd like to read that poem sometime if you don't mind. Yeah. You don't have a copy of it? I do, Riley, but uh, it's worry. put up, up in the <laughs> attic, and I, I would probably spend 30 minutes trying to dig it out. Well, I can get y'all a copy if y'all, when we get through, give me a... Yeah, send it to me. Yeah. You know, somewhere to send it to. And yes, sir. I'll leave you my email address. I mean, or... I'm not a poet, but this was back right after I'd got out of the Army and was living up in Georgia. Okay. And uh, I just had a son born, and mm-hmm. right in the beginning of hunting season in October, and I was just feeling good. I just started bow hunting, never bow hunted. Mm-hmm. And I was whacking and stacking some deer, you <laughs> yeah, know, and yeah. young <laughs> and right. full of it, you know. Yes, sir, right. absolutely. Your passion was <clears throat> well, and I hot put and it, heavy at that point Put in time. it down on paper, and yeah. my, his mom, my ex-wife at the time, or my wife at the time, ex now, but uh, she was <clears> an artist, and I had her do a pen and ink drawing mm-hmm. and the poem in the middle of it, and it turned out real good, I thought. But, you huh. know, just, awesome, yeah. If you're a true hunter, it definitely rings oh, yeah. in your heart. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'd love to read it yeah. uh, whenever Absolutely. y'all can get it. So uh, that does bring us to the first question I'd like to ask is, uh, are you guys from this area? Well, first let me ask this, and we don't have to include this, but I assumed it was okay to say Geneva WMA because – it's not really a secret it's, that that's where it was killed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just said it's all over Facebook. <laughs> that's that's yeah. not what I thought. Just want to make sure. I'm you sure know, there the were thing, a lot the of thing about a, a really good deer like that, it does draw. It's just like catching a big fish. It does draw a lot of people. Well, where'd you kill it at? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to kill that deer again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. You know, yep. and y'all know as well as I do, these these mature bucks, they're a, they're a different animal to hunt. That's mm-hmm. right. In the whitetail world. Yeah. Uh, and they are where you find them, and yeah. sometimes that's the the least likely spot. I think you I think you said it all when you said uh, that a mature buck is a is a different animal. Uh, I think that <clears throat> I think that hunting a mature buck is just a different ball game. It is within itself. Well, and it's you brought that up, but y'all coming in here, y'all seen, and and that's why I asked where y'all are from. I mean, I don't know where y'all come from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But coming in here, y'all seen all the farmland. 
Yeah. Geneva management area is over here. And when he killed that buck, pictures started coming out of the woodwork that he had been seen down here toward Florella. He yep. had been seen up toward New Hope. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had pictures of him all over the county. <laughs> And Gene just happened to be there that day when mm-hmm. he come by. Right, you know, right time at the right spot. Huh? Exactly. Yep. I'll yep. take a little bit of luck over that's good right. any day. Hey, hey, that's exactly that's right. right. But to answer your question, um, I'm from off Alabama. We're originally from Elba. That's mm-hmm. my older brother. And then I'll let him tell you where he's where I he's grew from. up in Op as well. Yep, uh, we're all from Op. Well, really? I live yep. about three miles out of Op going toward elbow off 84 out there so. he does too okay. yeah I, then i'm probably right there i'm i may be your neighbor <laughs> <laughs> highway I'm 415 a, well archie you, road you know where county road 72 is uh you know where the the new outpost is where uh-huh. they sell ice cream stuff like that on 84 if you turn right between uh right between that that little block white church and the outpost right there on 72 go down there uh probably about a half a mile i live up on mm. in a in a brick house up on a hill there oh, yeah. well i live back toward carolines from, okay from okay. you yeah. off of uh, county road 30 yep it's covington county 30 but you go about a quarter of a mile up on top of the hill and the coffee county lines right there yes sir and i live just past it i know right where you're talking about yes sir well about that so we are yeah, kind of neighbors. yeah, that's right. That's right. We're just right through the woods from each other. That's right. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to be able to hear on podcast. We were about to have a thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That sounded like <laughs> a good one it. out there. We, um, so, <clears throat> Mr. Gene, give us a little background of, of where you're from. I know we talked a little bit when we, we first met you when we come in your house, but uh, you said something about Florida and where you was from and all that. Yeah. Um, originally, our family lineage started out in Fort Walton Beach, right area. Um, in August of 69, uh, the town was getting too big, so our dad moved us to the Funiac on 150 acres of raw land, which uh, <laughs> mainly him, but we got the pleasure of clearing, picking up roots, planting fence posts. Uh, that's kind of what we grew up on. Right. Uh, our dad did land clearing, so we run heavy equipment, and we also moved houses. Uh, so we were taught hard work, yeah. uh, a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, around the Funiac at the time in the 70s, there weren't a lot of jobs. Yeah. Uh, so as we got older and started moving out, we would go to wherever the work was, which for me was Fort Walton. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where I put my roots down. Um, you know, circumstances being what they were. Mm-hmm. Real estate market got real good. Uh, I killed a fine buck up here. Uh, I'd come up here to hunt with my brother. So he was hunting by himself up here. And he said he had plenty of places to hunt. He just needs somebody to put a seat in it. Yeah. So I did. And yeah. uh, that encouraged me to, to find this house that we're in right now, which I don't think I could have got any closer to the Geneva management area without living on <laughs> I was about to say, we're just about down here in it, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Just about. <laughs> yeah, and you said that uh, you had just got into hunting as soon as you got out of the military. Have, have, y'all al- have you always We've, been a hunter? We have that? always uh, mm-hmm. been hunters. Uh, that was just a way of life growing up. You know, bow we hunting, had, right. But, that was uh, bow hunting. <laughs> we, we always said, you know, if they had a, a season where we could hunt them with a rock and a stick, we'd do that too. So yeah, bow right. hunting kind of mm-hmm. filled that niche. Right. There you uh, go. Muzzle loading, whatever comes along, uh, mm-hmm. we try to take advantage of it. I got you. No, we, um, me and him both, I started out probably five or six years old with a BB gun, shooting birds and stuff, you know, and then we moved to the Funiac, having that 140 acres, well, I'd come home from school in the evening, and I'd go to the woods, you know, of course, I'd have mm-hmm. cows to feed and hogs to feed, and daddy'd want me putting up fence posts, but I carried a gun with me, and so I was hunting from an early age, mama, she I'll clean this one for you. I'll show you how to do it. And I'll cook it for you. After that, you, the cleaning and this stuff's up to you if you're going to shoot it. You're on your I'll own. I'll cook it for you. But yeah. <laughs> so we'd cook it and bring it home, and she'd cook, cook it. Or we'd kill it, you know, and she'd cook it for us. Yeah, there yeah. you go. We, uh, um, me and Talon, uh, we kind of grew up the same way. My my dad has always been a hunter, a big hunter, and uh. Uh, we grew up doing the same thing, kind of shooting BB guns, you know, when we were too small to shoot big guns. But I think around seven years old is when I killed my first deer. And Talon was... Uh, a 10. And then maybe six 10, whenever something. I killed my first turkey. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've always been hunters, uh, kind of like y'all. So we can relate 
uh, and I believe Mr. Taylor, uh, he's always been a hunter too. I've known him since Buck That's was right. a cat. Mr. Taylor, you <laughs> got it right. Taylor, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Taylor. Bear, bear down on Mr. Huh? Um, but we, yeah, we um, hunted whenever daddy would take me a lot, mm-hmm. but most of his hunting was done, um, when he was younger and they ran dogs. Well, that was us. Uh, that was kind of the history of the hunting. When mm-hmm. we started, it was dog hunting and, mm-hmm. uh, our dad, he was a, a big hog hunter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he always had catch dogs and and stuff like that. So I right. had this thing whenever I was growing up. I don't regret doing it, but um, <laughs> I always told my parents that I wanted my first deer mounted. Daddy said, well, "I'm not mounting a doe." <laughs> and um, anyway, it was agreement that we had. So I didn't kill my first deer till I was 15. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which you waited on a a, a pretty good one. I it mean, was a really it, nice. It's six a point. really good six point. Yeah, I remember the day you killed it. Yes, I do too. Um, <laughs> Finally, uh, and then I don't know why I had that mindset, but I, I just wanted my first one to be a buck. Mm-hmm. And but now I'll shoot a doe in a heartbeat. I don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, have y'all always are y'all are y'all like big public hunt or public hunting uh, hunters or do y'all growing do up? Both? Uh, a lot of the land that we had available to hunt was Eglin Air Force Base. So okay, yeah, yep. it was okay. public land. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Pretty much that Blackwater, so Blackwater's mm-hmm. public land. Mm-hmm. That was all you. we had to hunt. Oh, right. yeah. you know, we had a little bit of you know private farm land we could hunt here and there. Neighbors' yeah. property, property, but it's uh, a different ball game hunting public land than private. It, land. it is, and it teaches you how to hunt around <laughs> people. Yeah, uh, that's right. And that's yep. a given on public land. Uh, mm-hmm. If you go and try to hunt it and hunt it solo uh, and not want intrusion, that's that's almost impossible. Mm-hmm. Right, you're gonna have people around you. The way I look at it is these deer, they deal with them people out there every hunting season, you know. And so they do their thing, whether hunting season's in or whether it's out, whether Mm -hmm. there's people there, it's just like farming. You know, you can watch deer farming and they would just get up and move out of the way, you know. I mean, that's the way Mm -hmm. they do. They continue doing the rut. They do their thing. Uh, They might, you know, and that's why he said about, you got to learn how to hunt around people because if you start going to the same spot over and over, it don't take long for them deer to figure that out. That's right. That's right. They can pattern you they just know, like you can they, pattern well, a you're, deer. You're in yeah. their living room. You're in their kitchen. You know, That's they right. live there. That's and right. And you've got to learn to, you know, if I go there for two or three times and I'm not seeing anything, then it's probably time for me to move. Yeah, right. And when you right. walk into your kitchen, you know when something's out of place. Exactly. exactly. And that's exactly how they are. Yep. Exactly. So when you're when y'all were coming up hunting public land, uh, I assume your your dad was there to teach you uh, about hunting the public land. Or is well, it the dog that hunting you was, out? you know, we hunted in a group and a party, you know, usually family mm-hmm. members and friends. But as we got older, you know, then we in, would into the eighties. You know, <clears throat> uh, stand hunting started becoming a, a thing. Uh, okay, and we were just talking about that a week or so ago. Uh, some of our primitive stands that we had in the beginning were uh you know they were just that they were primitive and and we didn't know you know so back then it was you were tree stand hunting if you had a amacker iron maiden we called them that weighed about 30 pounds yeah and 12 feet off the ground you know you you were styling you were bill jordan you know (laughs) yeah Uh, so so that was kind of where we got into it at you know a lot of learning yeah a lot of experience uh different from dog hunting you know the the mm. deer act different uh if they're not running wide open right you don't have that alarm system of the hounds going off letting you know they're coming mm-hmm. yep uh so and that also just lit a different fire inside of us too mm-hmm. yeah you know uh cat and mouse it gets game. more one-on-one oh, yeah. when you're stand hunting or stalk hunting yes. than when you're hunting with a party and throw a pack of dogs on one because you put a pack of dogs on one he's gonna get up and move that's right. Yes. You know. Yes. And I still love to hear a good race, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It is fun. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I'm not a – my dad dog dog hunted a lot uh, back in the day, back when y'all were talking about it, when it was popular. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're, we've never been big dog hunters, and, and all three of us have never been big dog hunters. I have been a few times. I've never even owned a, a deer dog uh, for myself, but, uh, but um, I've been down – where with the dog hunters down here at burnt house and and a few of the other guys and um it it it, it it's fun uh and it gets your blood boiling when the dogs are headed your way you know and it's a roar of dogs just coming and like you said the alarm of the dogs and uh it, it is fun 
Uh, but <clears throat> I still find myself wanting to go back to that one-on-one cat and mouse game with the deer. Well, um, there's nothing like watching a, especially a buck easing through the woods. Yeah. You know, just being cautious. Uh, right. It's always amazing to and, me how they can be a ghost in the woods or they can be the loudest bulldozing thing in the woods. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that always amazes me. And disappear while you're watching them. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, you watch it walk up and stop behind a tree and you know you, that it's there, but the yep. minute it stops moving, it's amazing how, how much that, that brown fur can just blend right That's in. That's right. Disappear. It's, uh, and, and like you said, when you're watching the deer and it's not being chased by dogs, it's doing its own natural thing through the woods and and that's fun to watch. Well, I've got to ask this, you know, I was wanting to get into the learning curve of the public land when you guys started hunting that. Uh, and I guess I'll ask the question this way is what is a mistake that you see a lot of people doing when they're hunting public land? I know, uh, Mr. Gene told me that you like to do a lot of scouting. Um, what are some things that you I just look like for? being in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> if uh, I can be in the woods, uh, I'm learning something, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's deer hunting, hog hunting, turkey hunting, finding mm-hmm. an arrowhead or finding a piece of Indian pottery or something from the past, mm-hmm. you know, piece of an old turpentine, catfish tree or something. There's always me. I'd rather be in the woods than I had to be downtown. Yeah. I'm yes. not a, I'm not a city guy. Absolutely. You scout or. You do that during the summertime as well? Well, no, because it gets too damn hot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting too yeah. old. But, you know, when I was young like you guys, you know, yeah, I could get out there and traipse in the heat. But mm-hmm. Yeah. No, uh, when it goes to getting hot, I go to the house. See, I would yeah. love to scout during the summertime and do more stuff like that during the summer. But I'm scared of snakes. I'm scared of snakes. <laughs> and I never just Well, you come just up catch on one them and kill them and eat them. And That's then right. that way they ain't no problem no more. There you go. <laughs> you know, you just get them rattlesnakes out and fry them up and eat them. They taste just like chicken. I, well, <laughs> well, I've also seen videos of people grilling snakes. And they're trying to crawl off the grill. That's a no for me. I, 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 I'll leave all the eating of the snakes to my brother. I'm, I'm just going to do what I need to do to him and leave him there. That's there right. you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, well I, never, uh, I never can just walk up on one, like, from a distance. Every time I see one in the woods, it's just right there on me all mm-hmm. of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And anyway. Well, growing up in Florida, in the South in general, mm-hmm. we got alligators, water moccasins, rattlesnakes. I mean, that was just part of it, you know. You learn. Right. That's part of your environment. You respect them things. You give them the room they need. But there was a time when I first moved to Fort Walton, because I moved to Fort Walton before he did, once I left the Funiac. Like he said, nothing was there. So I wanted to go back down there where there was jobs and there was women and more fun. And, right. Yeah. You know, as a 19-year-old. Yeah. More, ready to get in there and get it. More, and, more opportunity <laughs> on, in all directions. Yeah. Exactly. And I agree, 100%. That's yeah. when I, I'd never eat any rattlesnake, but we, us boys, you know, we'd kill one and say, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's skin it out and salt the hide. And it was like, well, what are we going to do with the meat? Well, let's eat it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we had to try it. So we yeah. eat a few of And you can eat it. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like anything else, you know. Mm-hmm. It may not be ribeye steak, but it's ribeye snake. Ribeye rib snake. Ribeye <laughs> snake. Yeah. 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 I've, uh, I have tried a little. Uh, I have tried some snake before at a uh, a wild game banquet. Uh, somebody brought some rattlesnake, and I tried, and it was really—I mean, it was actually pretty decent. I mean, I, it wouldn't be my choice of of you know just coming in on a regular day and say, "Hey, I want rattlesnake for supper." Right. But uh, but yeah, it it was actually pretty good. I mean, it wasn't bad at all. Well, growing up on that 140 acres in the woods, I'd come home in the evenings and get one of the guns, and I'd go back there, and I was going to shoot something. Right. Whether it was a quail or a dove or a rabbit or a snake mm-hmm. or whatever, and a raccoon. And like I said, my mom, she could clean anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could tell you some stories about her cleaning hogs and cleaning deer that daddy'd run over with the truck. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, that's how you learn what you like, what you don't. You know, there's some of that stuff, like an opossum. You can eat possum. Mm-hmm. I'm not real fond of it, but now raccoon ain't bad. Mm-hmm. So you you eat a little bit of it. You find out what you like, what you don't like, you know. That's right. And if there comes a time where if you need to, you know you can eat it. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> before we dive off uh, into the story of the deer, uh, I have one question before we dive off in there is, what, do you think that 
y'all would have ever killed a deer to this caliber in Florida where you come from. I, there, yeah. yeah, and I'm going to say this because yeah. I, we grew up there. We mm-hmm. hunted there most of our life on and off, right. and I did taxidermy for about 18, 20 years down there. Okay. There's some good bucks come off of Eglin. Really? You know, people look at Eglin and go with scrub oaks and pines and tie-dye swamps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the thing that Eglin has that <clears throat> a lot of places don't is they have a lot of closed areas where there's live ammunition, bombing runs, stuff where you can't go in there at all. It's closed to the public. No hunting pressure at all. So that and creates. Those kind of deer know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's and right. that's where you get them good deer down there is they have a, a closed area that they can go into, be safe, not hunted, mm-hmm. and they can die of old age and die big deer. And I have mounted some big deer off of Eglin. Really? So they're, ever, they're anywhere and everywhere, you know. Age yeah. is going to be the, to me, is the biggest thing. Whether it's good food or genetics, you, that, that increases right. the, the, the chance of having a good deer. But age, letting them get past that three-and-a-half-year-old mark, getting on up into four, five, six, seven years old. Yeah. And that's what people don't realize is, you know, yep. that they're just coming into their own at three-and-a-half years old. That's right. And three-and-a-half, <clears> that's... When a lot of deer get shot in the two and a half and three a and a half is mostly if what they, you get killed. I was about to say if they even make it to three and a half, yeah, yeah, yeah. four and um, a half and five and a half is really good, yeah, and, and hard to find, right? Yeah. At least and, in the places I hunt. You know, I feel like <clears throat> I feel like a deer like this. Uh, I don't, y'all don't know the history behind this deer. I, mm-hmm. I don't guess, but a deer uh, of this caliber, I think at the age of, do you know how old he was or did they age him? They aged him at five and a half. Five and a half. Well, that's what, that, that proves my point. I think that a deer that's with, with good genetics like this, that that's this big at five and a half years old, I believe at two and a half years old, he was probably a shooter in a lot of people's book. Yep. So a lot of the times these deer that are, that are shooters at two, two and a half years old at this caliber, they don't ever see how big this deer got or they don't ever see the age that this deer is and how big he is because they've, they've already been shot and it's on somebody's wall already at two and a half years old, mm-hmm. especially with, with such good genetics, uh, you know, like this one. Well, you take a deer like that at two and a half and most of your average hunters, and I'm going to throw myself in that mix too. Mm-hmm. If he comes by you on public land, you're probably going to shoot him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But he'll never have a chance to get any bigger that's right that's like people that kill coal bucks what they want to call a coal buck yeah well they're right he's a coal buck because he'll never get any bigger than what he was when you shot him that's right but i have also the property i hunted in laurel hill i hunted that property almost 10 years exclusively Mm -hmm. and uh it was a prime piece of property and i fed on it and i run cameras on it and i saw deer grow up and get past that two and a half mark so you got to you got to manage it a little bit and actually get well, to watch them grow you bigger. have to be able to have a little bit of restraint yeah and uh it's hard to do on public land because you're thinking well them other three fellows i yep. watch go to their stand they're gonna, are kill, gonna him. kill him if he goes by them. that's right but uh we have yep. some deer out there we were hunting this year that uh they're going they're going to run right next to him really and yeah they're still there yeah good deal uh, what, that and uh I, i'm not a huge public land deer hunter but uh to hear things like that you know where guys are public land hunters and and spend a lot of time down there that uh that makes me happy to hear that there are some good good genetics there's some good deer down there and they actually made it through the season uh which gives you hope for the next season and and also the the deer that they breed and the next generation coming behind them uh, that that's always good to see at the end of season. Well, we have a a buddy who was actually on part of Geneva when it was a hunt club, mm-hmm. and they were managed then. And uh, another thing, not a lot of people know, is part of Geneva was closed for was it five or seven years? I heard seven years for a turkey for a turkey study from the <clears throat> uh, University of University Auburn. of of Auburn. Wow! So there was no hunting at all on it right. during those those years. And uh, the herd out here was also repopulated with some t- Texas deer back okay. in the 30s. Yeah. Um, and well, that's to where be that, honest with that you, genetic was, line comes from. I was about to say that looks just like a Texas deer. Um, I've seen a, a bunch of them. Now, I've never been to Texas actually, myself, but uh, the pictures that you see of mm-hmm. Texas deer are wide, and, and they look exactly like that. So, like you said, that, that 
um, that opens yeah. your eyes to a lot of things. I did not know that. Well, when I posted pictures of that, and like you guys said, that deer is still easy to find on Facebook, and that mm. circles here and there. Um, a lot of comments from older hunters have commented of the genetic line that they have seen mm. and killed on Geneva over the years. And uh, it falls in line with that. I've seen some really good bucks that's come off this area over the years. Right. So when you killed the deer, did you have people reaching out to you, uh, maybe sharing some trail camera pictures that they had of it or telling stories about it? Um, I did, actually. uh had several people sending me trail cam pictures. uh actually had a, a gentleman send me a trail cam picture of it about 30 minutes before I shot it. Really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Now, when I saw it on Facebook, I, I saw your picture with it. And um, uh, this was the year that you killed it. And I saw it come up. And, of course, it was all around town. Um, when I looked at your picture, the first thing I did was I saw the picture. I saw that was a fine deer, but I wanted to see what the comments said. Uh, so I went to the comments on Facebook, and I did see, uh, like you said, a few people had put on there that we, we got this on trail camera. and uh, And... Uh, it's just like, man, I, I was thinking to myself, which at the time I didn't know you, we'd never talked to you, but I was thinking to myself, like, what is the odds that Mr. Gene is the one that killed that deer and all these other guys? Now, you know, I would have been guilty of it too. I would have been down there every day. If I got something like that on camera, I would have been down there all the time. Uh, and you know, some of them other guys probably were. Yeah. Those guys were definitely hunting that deer. Um, I actually had talked to people who had been hunting that deer for two and a half years. Really? Uh, I mean, I had pictures of him on food plots, trails, uh, different dates on the, on the Mm. the pictures they were sending me. Was this public Um, land that they were hunting on? Yeah. Yeah. So his. And also, like I said, I know some of the guys on the dog hunt club and they immediately started reaching out to me, you know, yeah, we've run him, you know, we've shot him. And like I said, I. I found some buckshot in his neck when we were skinning him out. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. So you know what's funny? I don't know who shot that gun. He had, out. <laughs> he had a he had a camera. It wasn't a cell camera. It was just a card camera mm-hmm. within sixty yards of where he pulled the trigger on it. Never had a picture on him. Didn't even know he was there. Yeah, that, was that, in the area hunting a different buck. Yeah. Um, a good good eight point, but uh, I had no clue that deer was used in the area. That goes right back to our point. We had a podcast not too long ago and me and Talon were, we, we, well, we're adamant about no matter what is on your camera, get in the woods because you never know what's going to walk by. Well, Whether you've that had camera pictures only or not. sees a 20 foot wide. That's right. At best 40 or 50 foot, you know, distance. Right. And, and we have watched it ourselves sitting over cameras deer walk all around them cameras and in front of them and it don't take a picture it don't of them. take a picture that's right that's um, right you yep. know so that camera it's it's just a tool yeah it's just a piece of the puzzle that's right um i know there's a lot of uh controversy now about it being unfair and i can get it to a degree um but that camera only provides you a slice of time that's and a right. small slice of space yeah, yeah right now there's states that are uh out cameras the and drones cameras. Oh, mm-hmm. drones. That's a big one. Yep. Yeah. I've been seeing some of that. Mm-hmm. Now, drones may take it to another level. Yeah. Uh, I can, especially if they're heat. A thermal sensor. drone. Yeah, a thermal yeah. drone. Yeah, man. That's a, that's. But on the other side of that, you got that guy that can fly <coughs> his drone and fi- recover your deer. Mm-hmm. I mean. If they would, I, that would be great mm-hmm. for that to be legal, but. To find deer and to hunt deer with a with a thermal drone, I think that's taking it a little too far. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's even in if my they, opinion, how, how if much technology that, do you need? If they yeah, made that right. legal, to me, it's not ethical as a deer hunter. It's not. That's and, right. and asking within myself, would I do that? Mm-hmm. That's well, not it, fair ta- chase. It, it takes the sport out of it. That's right. Why? Why would you want to do that? You could go down here to a game ranch, pay them, you know, a couple thousand dollars, and that's go out right. there and shoot one at a feed trough. Mm. It's the same exact thing. That's not hunting. That's right. That's uh, exactly right. I the, agree. The thrill of the hunt is, am I going to have to go buy beef this year, or am I going to end up with some deer in the freezer? Well, that's, that's exactly right. Just like right. last year, I had went over and found some sign and some pines, and this was coming up on the rut. It weren't the rut yet, but, boy, I found a place where a buck was just tearing up the side of a hill with some scrapes. And I told Gene, I said, I'm going to go over there and see if I can't set up on this buck. But there were small trees. So I couldn't get very high up, 
And I hadn't hunted the area. I just went in there and found this sign and jacked up in it. And that morning, here comes a nice buck. He's about a two and a half, maybe probably about a two and a half year old. He was fixing to get a bullet, but he come around the corner <laughs> on that trail and he's looking, coming up the hill and he's looking right at me. And I'm only probably 12 or 14 feet up as high mm-hmm. as I can get in this pine tree. So he locks up. I lock up. We're in a staring contest and I can see him doing this. You know, you know what's fixing to happen. But I knew as soon as I moved, he's fixing to leave. And he started backing up. I'm thinking, well, maybe he'll just walk off. You know, I mean, you're sitting there, all this shit's <laughs> happening in a heartbeat. <laughs> and I'm going, maybe he'll just turn and walk off and I can get on him. Oh, he turned all right, inside out, and around behind the Yopon bush. And I'm sitting there going, and I can't get on him, and he just disappears. And yeah. I tell Gene later, I said, you know. I said, sometimes it's kind of like, and I'm not a chess player, and I don't know nothing about the game other than that I've heard it's a strategy game. <laughs> but sometimes the Bucks win, and sometimes mm-hmm. I win. And that yeah. day he won, and all I can do is it's tip my hat to him and go, "That's right, you beat me this year. Yeah, Next right. year. And then what they do, they come in during the summer and cut that timber and thin road it. He's gone. So now it's changed everything, <laughs> you know. <laughs> what you, what you did one. know, you have to learn again. Yeah, that's right. And that's what we call it. Every year we go to Whitetail School 101, <laughs> yep. and we repeat those grades because we've yep. never graduated. That's right. You know, that's, as, that's right. As long as we're in there learning – and our opponent is as good as he is, we'll never graduate that school, hopefully. <laughs> That's right. You know, I don't want to ever say that I know it all yeah, about right. deer hunting. Mm-hmm. Yep. I won't learn every time I go to the woods. <laughs> well, if you do say you know it all, you're lying. The uh, deer's I, I, fixing to tell you you're right. lying. Yeah, somebody's that deer will humble you. <laughs> yeah. right. By the time right. you think you know it all, they will humble you, mm, just like that exactly one did. Right. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Mm. Well, I want to hear the story. Yeah. And yeah. don't yes, leave sir. anything out. <laughs> yeah. Let's dive in. Start from the very, very top. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to start this because well, he's, uh, okay. he's the beginning <laughs> lead of this. Yeah. So I had moved up here. I'd been hunting up here in Alabama for the last 30 years all all over all the way over to pineapple but i had come up here and had just moved up here and had 200 acres leased i'd got out of a hunting club and y'all may know it the sand hunting club up on the right out of brantley right there on the uh, conecta river we had about four thousand acres had some good bucks on it we've killed some really close to that up there but anyway i'd got 200 acres on my own and then the next year, I couldn't afford it, so I come down here. I said, well, I'll just go to Geneva and hunt, you know. And so I hunted by myself down there. I killed one two-and-a-half-year-old eight, you know, just a standard shooter. And that next year, I called Gene, was talking to him. I said, well, won't you come up here and hunt with me some? I'm hunting by myself, you know. And he was hunting in Laurel Hill. I was pretty much making the drive anyhow because I was hunting down there every weekend. Yeah. So uh, I said, screw it, you know, just buy my license and come up here and hunt with him. That's so right. with he, all this, he had all these hot spots he needed to see. To, well, you, <laughs> you know, so I like being in the woods, like I told y'all, scouting and stuff, you know. And so I'd found buck sign. I mean, there's buck sign all over. I mean, especially two or three weeks prior to the rut, you know, the rubs and the scrapes go to showing up. Mm-hmm. And I can't hunt them all. I mean, I can put my my butt <laughs> in one seat at a time, you mm-hmm. know, even though I may have two or three stands. I can only hunt one at a time. So I called him. I said, come up here and help me hunt. I said, I got buck sign located all over. And I said, I got this one over here. I called him the bulldozer buck because down a fire lane, he had scrape after scrape after scrape. I said, there was he, probably 12 scrapes down that fire lane. Just, yeah, or more. You could throw from one to the other to the other. Mm-hmm. And you were calling him bulldozer buck. But, because he but was tearing not, up because they'd come through there and they'd just slang dirt. You know, scrapes this big. But you had not seen them yet. I had not seen nothing okay. other than the scrapes. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Hadn't hunted it. Hunting other bucks, other places. Gotcha. So when he come up here, I rode him around, you know, because I didn't know what he liked to hunt. Me, I always find, wind up in the thick stuff. <laughs> but I showed him this buck, that buck, this sign, that sign, you know, and he's going, well, this is too thick. I'd take him in the swamp, you know, and you might have a 30-yard <laughs> shot. And he's going, I, I like to hunt open areas where I can see it. <laughs> so he has a lot of coughing and issues, you know, clearing his throat, which I do too sometimes. But um, he said, I can't hunt up close. I need to get where I can hunt out there. I said, okay. So I showed him some places, and one of them was a the bulldozer buck. So he had put a camera out there, and we had several does and some young bucks on it. And I was way over on the other side of the management area that morning when he 
called and uh, he said, I'm going to pull my stand this morning because I ain't seeing nothing over here. He said, didn't see it the last time I was in here. And then I get a call and then I get a picture and I'm going, holy shit, well, this is about 7.30. <laughs> and I'm going, hey, you're just going to have to wait a little bit because I'm in a good area and I was feeling good about it. I've done seen some deer and I'm going, you're just going to have to wait a few minutes and I'll come over in an hour or two. So then that's when the picture started coming. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, I get over there and here he is propped up on this thing in the woods i'm going you ain't even left have you he goes hell no i ain't leaving somebody may come along and get him <laughs> and i go damn son and i looked at that thing and i go that is a once in a lifetime buck mm. yeah he goes you know what's funny he goes i didn't even know what i'd shot and i let him pick up the story from there but i didn't uh, have a clue uh i'd been in that spot probably four sets and had seen a couple does uh, it was a really good looking spot. The one side of the, the fire lane was over to my right and it bordered some really thick woods. I mean, you couldn't throw a, throw a nickel in it. Mm. Um, the part I was sitting in was kind of open pines with the, you know, the, the tie dyes and yoke ponds in it. And the swamp made a little pocket down in front of me where well, the deer had a trail crossing through the pines coming out of that thick stuff. Well, I had watched three other hunters on my camera going in and out of the swamp hunting over there in the three weeks i had a camera over there uh, and you know on geneva they close about every two weeks both both season all year long but they only open every couple of weeks for gun hunting okay so we weren't archery hunting at the time so we were just you know those weeks it was closed we'd just monitor the cameras mm -hmm. watching these people go in there. and we had been down in the swamp and there just wasn't much sign in there of what you would think matching what was out on the fire lane and uh, had a good buck crossing on that trail was what I was hunting. But the weekend before, we had went over across the swamp about a 1,000 yards away on another fire lane and found some more good sign. Uh, like he said, you can find it just about everywhere you want to walk in the woods out here. You can find it during the rut. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to move over there. I'd done, you know, spent three or four sits over here. Kind of felt like I'd seen what that area had to offer uh wanted to move <laughs> somewhere else you know fish may be biting over there <laughs> uh, so i had hunted in laurel hill that sunday killed a buck down there got it to the processor all that told the wife said i want to run up to geneva and move my stand by the time i got up here sunday afternoon it was late and i got into the stand i said i'm just gonna pull the camera move it to the new spot I'll show back up on Tuesday, February 1st, when it opens, and I'll hunt this stand, and I'll pull it when I get down. So uh, that was what I did. I moved the camera to the new spot, left the stand there, uh, took off work, come back on Tuesday, slipped down the road probably 300 yards away was where I was parking, uh, walked in, no light, just trying to be as unobtrusive as I could getting in there. So right. I slid in there, uh, got up in my stand, and I like to sit high. so. 35, 40 feet up in a pine, you know, uh, sat there that morning, <laughs> nothing. That's pretty high there. <laughs> God. That's good, yeah. though. I mean, that's good. It, in the open pines, that's what works. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, that's you right. have to get up. That's uh, right. And then you say there's an understory under these pines? Yeah, there is. So you kind of uh, have to get high like that to be able to see those pockets. Well, you will be surprised from the ground, you know, the understory's six foot tall. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. see 20, 30 yards over there. But when you get up 30, 40 feet, you can see in that stuff out there. You may not see everywhere, yeah. but you can see in openings the openings here, yeah. opening for there. ways. Right. Small pockets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I like to hunt, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I got up in the tree that morning, and I was facing down into the swamp. The fire lane was over on my right, all those thick woods, that pocket of the swamp was down in front of me. And to my left, the pines kind of made a curve, you know, the way they'd planned them. And I could see over that way, 90, 100 yards, you know, in pockets. Um, so about 10 till 7, probably, I get an alert on my phone. I look at it, and it's the camera I had moved the weekend before. And there's my buck, that nice good looking eight points over there walking in front of it yeah so i immediately start kicking myself for not taking <laughs> the time to move the stand you know i could have could have been killing that buck right and then i start hearing something over there to my left 
sounds like uh, somebody walking through the woods is the best way to describe it. Just sticks breaking, you know, vines pulling. And I'm like, great, somebody's walking from that food plot down alongside this swamp. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking and looking. I can't ever see nothing, and I hear it, and then it'll quit, and then I hear it again, and it's moved up a little more behind me. I think, well, maybe it's some hogs, you know, over there rooting around, and because they burn that stuff off, so that leaves all the the dead yopons and what, and then they'll grow back, you know, and uh, it's hard to move around out there without making a lot of noise. Oh yeah. So I'm hearing that, you know, for probably five minutes off and on, and it gets up behind me. I said, well, it's going to cross the road and go over into the swamp on the other side, but it doesn't. I hear it again, and it's like right behind me sounds like so i, said, I gotta see what this is mm. so uh the tree stands that we use are old man tree stands you sit facing the tree uh, yeah it's a lot more comfortable it's something to hide behind so i just ease my stand up and i move around the tree about a quarter of the way you know have to adjust it a couple of times sit back down i look over to my left and i see the deer walk through an opening he's got his head down and all i can see is he's got a wide rack yeah you know, and boom, you know, instantly go into mode, bringing my gun up, safety's off, get him in the scope, and he's walked in behind some bushes, and he stops with his butt sticking out of one side of the pine tree. The gap in the two trees, I can see some fur, and then his head's behind a bush. So, you know how it is, uh, you're getting the gun on him, thoughts are flashing through your head, and I'm thinking, do I shoot through the gap? Mm-hmm. And my finger goes off. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to think about it much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I fired. The deer dropped right where he stood. Still couldn't see his horns. Uh, so <clears throat> when you saw him walking through the woods, you, you saw that he was wide, but you didn't see anything. That's all I that... could see. I, ha I saw none of the tines, right. nothing. I yeah. just, you know, all I saw was the top of his back and a wide rack. Yeah. I thought that's that eight point I've been hunting. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. putting him down. Mm-hmm. Um, so I fired on him. Uh, he dropped. And I seen him drop. Back leg kick maybe twice, you know. Right. Uh, I'm like, heck yeah. <laughs> well, I sit there in the tree for about 30 minutes. He I'm, thinks I'm, he's I'm, still I'm in Florida. To, I'm used to hunting in Florida. And you can kill more you than one a day kill, down kill there. Day, <laughs> so yeah, it's 7 o'clock. Heck, I, I might get lucky again. Uh, but then I realized, like, dang, I'm hunting in Alabama now. I'm, I'm done for the day. Yeah. I need to get down and, and see what I've got on the ground. Right. So I let my gun down. I come down out of the tree, you know, and. I ease over to where he's at, and I walk around the corner, and I look at him, and the first thought that hits me is, somebody has shot a monster and lost it. Now, where, where's the deer <laughs> where's I the shot? Deer shot? Uh, he ain't thinking, there's no way I did not see all them horns, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and I actually looked around yeah. for another deer. Like, really? this ain't mine. Well, Holy I couldn't God. find mine, so I took that one. <laughs> hey, that's but, funny. Uh, I walked up to him and I'm looking at him and it's just, it's unbelievable. It's yeah. disbelief. Um, <laughs> and I go to text my brother and I uh, got another buddy that hunts over toward Brantley. Um, I've just killed a monster. I yeah. said, this is a huge 10 point. And they're like, oh, no, send me pictures. You're lying. <laughs> yeah. Well, most of the time around here when somebody says that, they you send know, something that's not even outside the ears. Uh, you know, it's just. Well, that yeah. was definitely the opposite of ground shrinkage. Yes, uh, yes. And, I mean, it was just unbelievable to me that I had killed that deer. Right. And I uh, had not seen the amount of antlers that he had on his head. Right. You couldn't uh, knock the grin off of his face that morning with a lighter <laughs> thought. <laughs> I mean, he just sat there and it's like, <laughs> so, I go, damn, son, quit grinning. He goes, I can't. <laughs> I, I sent him a picture of it and he said, dang, son, I put you over here on that bulldozer buck. He said, I figured you'd kill a D6, not a D9. I said, I didn't. I killed a D10. <laughs> killed a D10. And then uh, he says, good. uh, he said, well, I'm going to sit here and hunt. I'm going to finish my high. I said, that's fine. Yeah. I'm, mine's finished. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I just propped up on the tree there and, uh, <laughs> took pictures. Social media. So <laughs> then the sunlight, you know, come up and shine on him a little different. I take some more pictures. Right. And I, I went to thing. posting it on social media and, uh. 
the biologist from the check station, he was wearing me out. And I didn't even know. I wasn't looking at Messenger. But right. he had tried to call me through Messenger. Of course, I have all my <laughs> sound on my phone turned yeah. off. Uh, he's messaging me. If that deer's <laughs> killed on Geneva, you need to bring him over here. We need the data. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I sat there for two and a half hours waiting on him to show up with the wagon to haul him out. <laughs> so well, Then uh, I get there and help him haul him out. So he's got this gorilla cart. <laughs> like a plastic wagon, you know? Yeah. So we get him any. And my brother here used to be a mud racer. He raced four-wheel drive mud trucks, you know? So he, we get him in there. Like he said, he sat there done two, two, three hours. We get him in there. We start out to the fire lane. Here he goes. Right through his stump hole. The deer in the wagon turn over. The buck falls out. And I'm going, damn, son, you're going to have to slow down a little bit. This ain't a four-wheel drive, you know? He said, well, I'm going to try it out and see. <laughs> So we get up to the top of the hill to the truck, and I go, damn, it's like 11 o'clock. I'm going, I'm hungry. He goes, I am too. So we sit there and eat. You know, we ain't even paying no attention to his social media stuff. We're just looking at this deer, and we're eating us a sandwich. And then finally, we leave and go to the check station. And he can pick up from there. But Yeah. and uh, <laughs> So this whole time while you've been sitting with a deer, social media is blowing up. Blowing, blowing up. <laughs> burning down. I mean, <laughs> did, yeah, it did was hot. Did you own like a store? <laughs> By any chance that day? We come by we Caroline's did. up there on 84, and uh -huh. I was walking in. Gene was getting ice. Mm -hmm. And some young kid, he goes, you the one that killed that big buck, ain't you? And was I go, no, you? I was that my brother. Was meat. <laughs> 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 we, what? We had just that was a, one him. of my buddies. He, we had just yeah, dropped him off me. at the taxidermist <laughs> yeah. and was on our way back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I come out, and Riley's like, I fell over there, thinks I was the one who killed that deer. <laughs> <laughs> he said he saw him on Facebook, then he saw him at the store and watched him walk out the store. He said, that's him. He just killed that deer. <laughs> Went over and said, are you the one that killed that and deer? And I ain't on social media, so, you know, it was surprising to me, you know, that here we just went up there and dropped the deer off. Everybody seems to know. Yeah, and <laughs> here I am in the store. You know, you don't want to kill that buck. Now he's he's right over at the ice cream. <laughs> <machine getting ice. laughs> the funny thing about that was he carried the cart that we hauled the deer out in in back of his truck or on his jeep, whatever he was hunting out of. Well, after that, he had people in the mornings. <laughs> he'd pull into a spot to hunt and pass somebody that was out getting ready. Well, he said he's out, you know, getting his stuff on, getting ready, and he heard something. He looks over. Here's this guy standing there. He said, you the fella killed that deer? So I recognize that cart. Out of the <laughs> Man. I said, so, so even the cart's famous. I, I said, son, I can't do nothing no more without <laughs> Celebrities. Yeah. That's funny. So you, so Next you thing back. you know, somebody's going to say, I, I recognize your belt buckle. Yeah. <laughs> so you get back to the check station. And we pick we, it up from there. What happens we when get you get to there? the check station. Uh, actually, we had passed the truck down on the forest service road right before the check station and that guy seen in the horn sticking off the side the tailgate and when we went by he just whipped around and followed us you know so we get to the check station and there's probably three or four other hunters up there now waiting they, they got to bring uh, him they're in, all waiting know, they're, oh yeah i can <laughs> imagine zach the biologist he's up there you know kind of bouncing up and down and all right here he is here he is he finally <laughs> made it and uh, we pull in there and back up, and, you know, of course, everybody's patting me on the back and congratulating me. And uh, Zach says, man, you won't believe how much the phone has been blowing up since you posted that deer this morning. He said, we got people calling up here, won't know where they can go hunt, where they can go sit and kill a deer like that. <laughs> he said, so-and-so <laughs> called, said he had a picture of him walked in front of his camera this morning. I looked at Zach and said, well, he walked in front of my gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. I said, he won't see no more flashes after that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, from the time you shot it and when you get to the check-in station, what time is it? What's the time span I killed there? the deer at like 7 o'clock, pretty much right around 7 o'clock in the morning. It was like 11.30 when we got to the check station. Wow. Time. By the it time, didn't take long at all for it to blow By the in. time we yeah. got him out, did our eating, you know, had our little time together, and then made it over to the check station. And Gene, I think it was right before we got there is when he realized that, you know, he was getting calls and stuff, you know. They actually said they had uh, people calling down here from New York. Really? Yeah, it was and crazy. Even last year when I took the deer up there to be scored, uh, I had all the guys there at that time, and, and they were saying, you know, it was just incredible, the influx of people from all over the country. 
that showed up because of the picture of that deer. Really? Because you know That's the Alabama uh, Division of Wildlife and Fisheries, they posted that deer on their web page too <laughs> with the information of where it was killed and all that. Uh, huh. So that kind of blew it up a little more than mm-hmm. just right. the, the local post that I did. So that yeah. buck is definitely Geneva WMA record. They said well, they hadn't had a buck that quality in about six to eight years. Since Zach had been managing his yeah. part of it, he said he had yeah. never seen one like that come off of it. So <clears throat> when you, they, I'm sorry, when they ahead. scored it, when they scored it, did they tell you anything about how it fell within the state of Alabama or anything like that? No, not really. Um, they, they didn't really place it like that. I know I was a few inches under being a Boone and Crockett buck, though. Mm-hmm. What, um, you showed us the score sheet a while ago. Yeah. Um, do you, what was its gross? I believe the gross was like 157 and 5 eighths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it dried in at what? 151 and 2 eighths, I yeah. believe. Mm-hmm. That's a stud. That's a stud. You look at that deer, and then some of these people that say theirs is 160 makes you want to slap them in the face. Because <laughs> that deer right there is a monster. That's a monster. Did yeah. you ever think that you would kill one that big? Not without paying a lot of money. Yeah. Not for the cost of a license. Yeah. I mean, we've had, I've had people, or I've heard people say that they killed a 160 class deer and their rat could fit inside the one you've got there. Well, yeah. and that's be me doing taxidermy for as long as I did. Mm hmm. People have a tendency to, oh yeah, because, and I'll tell you the reason, because they never had 150 class buck in their hands. Right. You know, they're going by pictures. They're going by. Mm-hmm. You would be surprised that people would come in with a two and a half or three and a half year old deer, good rack, but have some gray up on the floor. Oh, that's an old deer. He's got gray on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I've had him come in and go. He ain't got no teeth right here. Well, when you take a jawbone out of a deer, he's got them front. And sizers right here, mm-hmm. and then right here he hardly has nothing, and then his jaw teeth are actually way back here, way back there. Yes, sir. Yeah. But they all, oh, he ain't got no teeth, you yeah. know. I'm going, <laughs> yeah, he's got teeth. Yeah, that's they right. may be wore down, but he's got teeth. That's right. Well, that's why I wanted to have that scored by an official score. I was gonna say, wasn't an official score? It was, yeah. and uh, I didn't want to because Zach actually scored that deer the day I killed it. Yeah. Uh, and his score was 164. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I personally, I've never held a deer like that, not especially not mine. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a little high. I, I watched the tape, and uh, I just kind of felt like that score was high. And I don't want to brag on it or talk about it and be telling a lie. Yes, yes, you know, so I agree. I wanted to know what he scored yeah, absolutely. by the official book. Yes. And uh, that's why it took me a year to put that together, but I, I finally made it happen and got yeah. that sheet. I agree 100% with you. Uh, we talked about this not too long ago, too. Is When I kill a deer, I try to – a lot of people, like you said, you being a taxidermist, you saw it a lot, uh, but a lot of people want to scale up on their deer. I mm-hmm. always scale down. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if I kill a, a good deer or a stud of a deer, <laughs> you know – I, a lot of people's like, man, that, that's that's a good score. It's gonna be a good score. It's gonna be this, and I'm like, ah, he may be 120, maybe 120. I would rather judge that deer <laughs> just on my my personal opinion at 140, 145. Yeah, yeah. and at score 151. Yeah, then judge it at 160 and yep. then be let down. That's because right. Because to me, that's, that's right. gonna diminish the deer in my eyes. That's yep. right. And uh, I don't care what the number is. That's a trophy. Right that's there. right. That's exactly yep. right. And, uh, Absolutely. The number's just a number. Yep. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. I've seen so many people when they they when they get their deer scored, they're happy about the deer, but when they get it scored, the shoulder slump, and they just you know it's a frown after that. Mm-hmm. And that's not what it's all about. No. You know, I, I don't want anybody to, and I'm sure y'all are the same way. I don't ever want anybody to feel bad about a deer that they shot. If they think it's a trophy, then it's it, every <clears throat> deer is a trophy within well, the, the eyes of the beholder. Here's a good example of how me and him feel about deer hunting. Mm-hmm. A few years before I got out of that hunting club up there, I was hunting on the power line, and I'd never hunted the power line much. It had a shooting house on it and a long food plot. But they'd kill some good deer off of it over the years, you know, and I was in that club for like 14 years, so I knew what was being produced kind of where. Mm-hmm. And so I went over there one afternoon, 
and I'm sitting watching down that food plot and down toward the bottom food plot also went back up the hill. Right probably 10 minutes before dark, I see a deer coming down the wood line, and there's smoke limbs hanging over between me and it, so I can tell he's got horns. Can't tell how big. It's getting late. Now he starts cutting across the food plot. Well, by then, I've done got, you know, <laughs> done got the fever, and he done fired me up. And I get on him, and you know when you when you got the fever, I mean, I'm sitting in a shooting house with a rest, and he's cutting across the the shoot or the fire, uh, power line at an angle. Mm-hmm. So he's not he's not going to be going across and be gone in a minute. He's going to be there. But I get on him. And I'm shaking so bad, I can't keep him in the scope. And I'm going, Riley, <laughs> calm down. Just take a breath. <sighs> and kind of like Gene, you know, when, once I get into that mode there, then the trigger takes over. And once that crosshair gets in that spot, then the trigger takes over, and then it's done. Right. Whether it's a hit or miss. And he turned, and he run back off the end of the food plot. And I got down, and I went over there, and I found him in the broom sage. And he was a six point. But you know what? <clears throat> When it quits doing that to me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether he's a six point or a ten point, that's mm-hmm. right. That's when I'll hang my gun up and I'll go get me a golf ball and a club, <laughs> beat, beat on it for a while. That's, that's right, right. You know? that's, that's right. right. But until that yes, happens, sir. that was a good hunt and that's a trophy buck in my. Yeah, that's because right. Because yes, well, I, I enjoyed a lot that of hunt. People yes, sir. tell me, you know, you need to just hang your gun up. You'll never kill <laughs> one bigger than that. I'm like. You don't know why I hunt. That's, yeah. not, that's not what it's all about. A that's doe right. can, can set me off. That's mm-hmm. right. And that's, to me, that's a little bit of the sad part about that buck. I didn't get to experience any of that. Yeah. yeah. Because I he shot, didn't. I just shot a deer. It uh-huh. happened It happened you know, so fast. and so I didn't know what I was shooting. Yeah. I kind of feel like I was robbed of that excitement, that mm-hmm. adrenaline rush yeah. of knowing I was killing my once-in-a-lifetime buck. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's but, right. man, the excitement when you walk up on it, you like, what? <laughs> yeah. A little seven Yeah, where's point. my little this year <laughs> that snuck up on me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He had me flustered just like he was talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was my, my hunt for the year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And his racks out there on the skinning rack, you know. It's yeah. funny that you say that. This year, uh, I killed, to me, a big eight point, and I was proud of that deer. But I killed a smaller seven point, and the story behind it, I enjoyed that hunt more than I did the big eight point that I killed because it was the first time that I rattled one in. Mm-hmm. And uh, funny story, I would listened to a podcast where a guy said, if you are not give out by the time you do a rattling sequence, you're not doing it right. And he's talking about how he does the horns. He's kicking leaves. Um, he's making all kinds of racket, pounding the dirt. And um, I was sitting on the ground in a seven point come out of a thicket. And uh, I was able to take him. And that the same thing that you said, I was shaking like a leaf. Called him right after it, actually. I said, Jason, I got one. I, got one. <laughs> I said, you're lying. Because it was about 930 in the morning and I was at work. I said, there ain't no way. He said, man, I'm telling you, I rattled him in. I said, well. Good dress. Out of the three right. bucks that I killed this year, that's the one that makes me the most excited. Fire, fired you it up. fired me yeah. up. Yeah. It's the hunt. It's kind of like the old Harley saying, it ain't the destination, it's the ride to get there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's right. kind of like deer hunting, you know. It that's ain't right. always the deer, it's the hunt that's involved. That's in right. That's right. It's how yeah. you get him on the ground. Yeah, I've always, uh-huh. liked, I've always liked that quote by Fred Bear. He said, if, if you're going into the woods – in search of a trophy and and don't quote me on exactly what the words are but if you're going in the woods in search of a trophy you've completely missed what it's all about that's right yep. you've missed out what it's all about yep yep but i uh, love it yeah. i'm sad that it's out of season right now <laughs> but my you, know, wife you know what the not. good you know what the good part is What's it's that? closer to the season than it was yesterday. That's, that's right. That's, that's exactly right. right. That's true. Yep. I'm like y'all though when when my heart when my heart stops beating and I stop getting really excited about shooting a deer that's the day that i'm gonna say you know what uh i'll you know go fishing or something that's right i'm gonna hang it up and find another hobby i don't see that day coming too too far out i don't either yeah i'm I'm gonna keep pushing well i'm 68 years old and i'm still doing it so that tells you something it ain't ever gonna stop that's right (laughs) it might but it's uh, gonna be because my body can't take me out that's right that's right that's right (laughs) (laughs) so i would uh regret not asking you this if we ended it before i did but um when you found this bulldozer buck you hadn't had pictures of it but you had found a scrape line that he was using um is that typically what you look for when you're scouting for deer what what is the ideal setup that you look for when you are hunting well, the way i buck? look at scrapes is 
You boys being from the country, y'all, I don't know if y'all have ever went to Panama City Beach, but why do you go to Panama City Beach? For the beach. For the women. <laughs> I'm married. I can't say that. When, when you go to the beach, <laughs> when you go to the beach down there, you don't go in the winter time, do you? No. Uh-uh. Why? Because they ain't, they got their clothes on in the winter. There's a lot more women down there. There ain't with no their women, are there? <laughs> That's right. All right. So I kind of look at this deer hunting. A buck is going to lay down scrapes where the girls are. Uh huh. He may lay down a few here and there. You'll find one here, you know, out by a field somewhere. And that's just a given. Mm-hmm. But when you start finding a bunch of them or a bunch of rubs, then that tells me that something, and there's usually more than one because when you got an older buck, there's usually some tag-alongs behind him. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have just one buck laying down this sign. There's going to be several generations that follow him, you know through the year when they're together. Now, they'll split up right there to rut for a little bit, and then they'll get back together. But that, to me, is an indicator that, okay, he's laying down a lot of scrapes here because there's a lot of doe traffic through here, or this is where some does are living, or there's does here for some reason. And I'm looking at them scrapes at, okay, so when can I perhaps catch him in here? Most of the scrapes, as you know, are done at night. Mm -hmm. But during the rut, I mean, it, it game's on any time of day, just right. like Gene with this one. Yeah. So I'm not saying that the scrapes are exactly what I look for, but it's just part of it. You know, scrapes and rubs, where they're at. It's all it's a situated. piece of a puzzle. That's mm-hmm. right. It's all pieces of a puzzle. Yep. Do you favor thick stuff? Well, I find that that's where I'm generally, where all these scrapes and rubs and trails are going to lead me to is where it's more thick. Mm-hmm. Do you hunt off the edge of it, or are you more I'm inside in the it, thicket? I'm on the edge, I'm out in the pines, I'll hunt in open areas. I mean, it's just... Wherever the best setup is, I guess. Exactly, mm-hmm. because yeah. have you ever walked into a place and you find all that good sign, and, and you go, and damn, this is a good place to be, mm-hmm. and you're in the woods, you're in the forest, but there ain't a damn tree here that I can climb yeah. to hunt <laughs> this spot. Yeah. They're all too crooked. They're all too big. You know, whatever. They're dead. Right. They're all too small. If y'all hunt hunting leases, you know what to deal with with pine plantations, right. you oh, know. Yeah. So just like that one buck with me two years ago, pines were about this big. Yeah. Well, a little higher than that ceiling, about all you can get up in them. Yeah. You know, now they're this big. That's right. So a lot of things <clears> dictate <throat> where I can hunt and how I can hunt it. And it's just a feeling, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I uh I killed a pretty good deer this this past year too and and I was hunting a, he killed one 30 yards from where I killed mine this past year. I killed one, mine with a bow, he killed his with a rifle. Talon. But yeah, yeah, he he killed his uh Talon killed his uh 30 yards, literally 30 yards from where I shot mine, he shot his. But we were in a pine uh a pine plantation and uh and it was it the trees were plenty big enough to to get up in um and as high as you want to go but the problem was uh it's just how high you want to go because out across there is just wide open and i actually set up on one side of the power line i was hunting a power line i set up on one side of the power line to start with um at the beginning of bow season i had two uh two small eight points they come out they busted me immediately uh so i had to i took my stand down uh reevaluated, and i went to the other side the uh of the power line. And I thought to myself, if they're coming from there, at least they'll be out here in the open before they bust me. And I'll at least try to maybe get a shot. Um, but you getting on up there at 35 to 40 foot, I was probably about 20 to 25 foot. Uh, but I probably need to go a little higher because I did get busted a few times before I shot mine. Well, uh, you got to think about this. <clears throat> well, when we're standing here, you know, and me with this hat brim, if I, I can see that TV, but I can't see the ceiling. Well, if I take the hat off, me just sitting here, I can see the floor. I can see the ceiling. Well, the deer's the same way. Yeah. And if you're 15, 18 feet, even 20 feet up, Mm -hmm. and it's nothing but tall pines with low undergrowth, you're not sticking out there that's unusual. That's right. You're going to catch their eye. Yep. You get up to that 30 or 40 foot, 35, 40 foot, now you're kind of getting up outside of that Out, peripheral vision well if you're yeah. not moving so i've mm-hmm. learned you learn this from bow hunting if you hunt low 
Mm-hmm. You need to hunt in some cover. Find you a tree yeah. that you can climb that's got something like a cedar or a magnolia or a bay tree or something that's still green. Right. Something that's got some cover so that I can jack up in it and kind of get hit in it. I may have to trim a little hole or something. Right. But now I've got something to kind of conceal my movements and my blob that looks unnatural that's on the side right. of a tree. Yes, sir. The human outline is hard <laughs> or to Or either hide go high. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And- in light of that, I did some uh, digging this season because of that getting busted hunting in pines. Yeah. Because it's hard to find something that gives you cover in planted pines. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started doing some research on snow camo in a tree stand. I found a company called Whitetail Forensics, WTF. Make that what you want. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought that when you said snow camo. <laughs> but uh, I actually ordered some yeah. of his camo this year, and mm-hmm. it's a very odd pattern. Yeah. It's a very odd color. But I had deer look at me, stare at me in the tree twice this year, and turn around and go back to feeding. Really? Huh. Couldn't make out your image, I guess. It blends with the sky. It breaks yeah. your outline. Uh, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. That it does breaks make your a lot outline. Sense. You're on the ground. When you're they looking... focus at you, you disappear. Yeah. Because you don't have that silhouette of a human. Right. Golly, that's, that's pretty smart. That's, so that's how'd you crazy. think of that? How'd you? What led well, you to that? A long, long time ago, one of the first companies that tried to address that was a, a sky camo. They had like a light blue pattern in their background. Mm-hmm. But it was still a traditional camo pattern. So I've I've looked at my buddies, my brother, whoever, when I'm walking up to them in the woods in a tree, and y'all know traditional camo it looks real pretty. Yeah, like we're sitting here. That's right. But you back off thirty yards and look at it outside; it's a dark blob. That's right. Well, especially with the tree stands that we use, where we sit away from the tree, mm-hmm. that kind of extends us out a little bit. That just enhances that blob effect. Yeah, that's right. So common sense tell you look out there at that pecan tree in my yard, the sky background against all them tree limbs <laughs> is gray. That's right. It's a light gray color. Yep. It's a lighter color. So you stick something, some tree bark camo or mossy oak up there. Yep. With that light background, all you're going to see is a dark blob. That's right. So that WTF camo has kind of a tan. Mm-hmm. colored background with uh, oblique patterns, dots, mm-hmm. oblong triangles, just different stuff. Well, you put it up in a tree. You've got now a light background on your your clothing, mm-hmm. and it rolls around the edge of your arm. You know, it may be black here and polka dotted over here with a tan right. background. Well, that outline of that arm disappears now. Yeah especially if you're not moving. And uh, it looks kind of funky. I've had some odd looks walking <laughs> in the store with it. But I know at least twice this year I watched does 30 yards out yeah. stop and look right at me and stare at me for 8 to 10 seconds, turn around, go back to browse, and never look up again. Yeah. One of the problems like you was talking about, <clears throat> getting picked off at a low height, what I have learned also is if you're in a spot like that where you can't have a tree or you don't have a tree that's got some greenery or something right there next to the one that you're climbing, take some with you. I have take one of the best things I have found that works. You all know what Greenbrier is? Yes, sir. You do? It's a vine that grows up from a, it looks like a sweet potato root if you dig it up, kind of. But it's a vine that grows up and it has a green slick leaf on it. Now, they say the deer that like to eat them too, but they usually climb up a tree tr- chasing the sunshine. And they're pretty easy, some of them are, to pull down. Well, they don't have any briars on them. So you're not getting stick, you know, stuck all the time. But you can take and cut you off a, a vine like that. I take 550 cord, tie it to my tree stand, and I'll pull a length. You know, it might be six, eight foot long, six, seven foot long. And I'll pull it up there with me, and then I'll take that 550 cord, and I'll tie it to the tree. Now I've got a vine growing up, which are growing all over these trees. So just it just something, something to, break to help break up mm-hmm. my human outline with them green briars there. No different than what you're doing on that tripod yeah. for that camera. Yeah. You know, just right. something to, to break that shape, that unusual shape yep. in the woods. I have done 
Boys, now I, I can tell you, I was hunting in a swamp <laughs> over there, sin hunting club, and the the main creek there it was as wide as this living room, and of course you know these banks up here in Alabama they'll be six foot deep, and the water may be that deep during the first part of hunting season. Now when it rains, it'll be up out of the banks. Mm-hmm. But I was in there watching just across that creek, so I was like from here to that dresser and that wall from the creek bank, but right here behind me, like. The other side of his pool was a heavy beat down trail. Well, I can't sit here and watch behind me and over here too. And I can't get somewhere where I can watch both. So I go by the auto parts store. Y'all know what an inspection mirror is? It's a little round mirror and it's on like a, <laughs> an antenna. So you can telescope it out, you oh, know, and yeah. you can oh, okay. stick it yeah, down yeah, in there and yeah. look around the mm-hmm. engine. Yeah. yeah. So I took some of that and some camouflage duct tape and I get up there and get my stand situated where I want it. And I find me a limb and I duct tape that mirror to it. And now I've got this damn mirror pulled out here. Where I can <laughs> sit here and I can watch this damn trail. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty smart. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. You got to do what you got to do. You, right. you got to right. be flexible. <laughs> that's right. right. To the situation. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I love hearing that kind of stuff yeah uh-huh. i love hearing that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. hey. hey it ain't crazy if it works that's, that's right, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. you only crazy until it works and yeah, when exactly. it works everybody's yeah, everybody everybody wants wants to it. It. Yeah. where'd you get that where'd you get that mirror from <laughs> hey. <Yeah. clears throat> well uh one more question before we close it out uh if you would have shot this deer with your bow do you think it would have i know for a fact you'd have went in a record book but um do do you think it would have been a record down here at uh, Geneva State Forest? I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought so. When I first looked at the deer, when I saw you on Facebook, I thought, I don't know what he killed that with, but if he shot it with a bow, <laughs> it, it's, it's going high in the record books. You uh, know, I know you guys probably know this. Uh, mm-hmm. Hunters don't always show what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's bucks that get killed down here that we don't ever see. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I know that for a fact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to say it's a record buck, it's a record buck to me. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, all that matters. If, if everything, yeah. if That's everything right. was equal, That's right. I don't know. That's right. I'm going to tell you this. I've got pictures of bucks bigger than that. Yeah, really. Yeah. Really. Yeah. i tell you what I'm amazed at. Uh, is I have in my, because I don't hunt, hunt public land a lot. As a matter of fact, I can count them on one hand the number of times I have. Uh, but what? Is that how many? Zero. zero. <laughs> it's, it's more than zero. <laughs> um, but I have it in my mind that it's a free-for-all. Any deer that walks is is dead. It can be. And it's just awesome to me that that deer made it as long as it did. And as big as it did, well, and for three years, people were trying to kill it. That's where I get back to, though. He may not have been living on Geneva. He's already proved that he's been three or four miles north of here, two or three miles south of here. You look at all the farmland, it's got patches of woods and the branches and the swamps and the creeks. Yeah, that's There's a lot know, of that, havens. That's that's so all much. he's got to do is just migrate off out there and spend the night. And just like Gene that morning, he was within 50 yards of being in that swamp. Where he would have went in that swamp, he could have used it like the interstate. Yeah. I, I honestly think that deer come out of the swamp, circled behind me, and worked a scrape right next to the road and was on his way back to the swamp when I killed him. Really? That's yeah. what he thinks. So there was a scrape next to the road. Like I said, I walked in that day without a light, so I couldn't look in the scrapes and see how fresh they were. Yeah. But the scrape by the road was... I mean, it was fresh. So, something had just been in there slinging dirt. Yeah. And I know from the sound <clears throat> that he come out of the swamp, went up there, and come back. Yeah. So putting two and two together, the only thing I could think of that would draw him out of that swamp right. would have been to go up there and work that scrape, see if any does had been in it. Mm-hmm. And then he was going back. But like I said, I had watched several hunters walk down the fire lane into the swamp hunting that area. Nobody was stopping and hunting out in the pines. Yeah. You know, so that's where I was at, doing mm. something different. You asked earlier about how do you hunt public land. You do something different than the public. That's right. You know, uh, one of the bucks I killed this year was in a little narrow strip between two roads. We had watched all kind of deer traffic crossing through there. 
and seen the first soul hunting it. Very first day went in there and said I killed that seven point. Yeah. Within two hours. Um that's what I found about hunting public land. It's do what everybody else is. Watch the other hunters. I mean, and that's the thing on public land. If you're hunting private land or where we was at in a hunting club, you had a designated area that that was yours if you signed out for it. You mm-hmm. know? But down here, you know, like you said, it's a free-for-all. That's right. So what, I, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is try to watch where them other hunters are going, where they park at. Yeah. You know, I may not know exactly how they walk in there, but if they're parking in this area, I know they're hunting that area. Yeah. You know their pressure in that area. That's and right. if they're there the next time that, you know, two weeks from now when it's open again and they park in that same spot, I'm going, okay, well, this is where they're hunting. And I'm probably going to be hunting the same buck, but I'm going to go down the road and come in from over there. Yeah. Or I'm going to go across the creek and get over there because... A creek to them deer is just like crossing the highway. That's you right. Know, they'll be across that creek. That's right. That swamp in just a few minutes, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, try to do something that this hunter, yeah. he, he keeps doing the same thing. Right. I'm going to try to do something different. Right. Well, you know, the deer is going to move around him, you know, and that's something I did a lot on Eglin as I was coming up. Um, I got a buck out here on the back porch on the walls, biggest buck I killed on Eglin. It was a 173-pound nine-point. I sat in the tree that morning and watched three other hunters walk by me. One of one of them was my cousin, <laughs> and go to their stand. Well, I killed that buck. I killed a five point that morning, and I killed a hog, all out of that same spot. Really? And Look, other looking at other hunters across the road in their tree. Yeah. Uh, no different than out here. Yeah. Uh, the deer pick up on that as well, and the deer are going to go where the hunter's not. That's right. It doesn't matter if it's uh, – he's got a story where he was hunting a, a spot, had a little head, went up behind some people's house. Mm. Well, they had a bunch of dogs in a pen, so nobody go up there and hunt. Last day of the season, he decides to walk up that bottom and jumps three rack bucks laying behind that dog pen using them dogs for their watch dogs. That, that was yeah. That's smart. That's, That's cool. crazy. Well, they knew them deer, mm-hmm. I mean, them bucks don't get that big by being stupid. And they knew that them pen foot dogs weren't no threat. Yeah. But if they seen something down in the woods, and it was maybe 200 yards from the creek bottom up to the side of the hill where their pens was. And I walked down probably halfway between the creek bottom and there, you know, just looking at all the rubs and the scrapes. I done killed two bucks up at the other end of this head or this bottom. But when I got up there that morning and them three rack bucks jumped up out of that thicket, I'm going, damn, I should have been down here. But I was like everybody <laughs> else. I was sitting four or 500 yards up there, and you'd hear them dogs down there. And I'm going, I, yeah. I ain't going down there. Ain't no way a deer would be yeah. down there, yeah. It's like down there at Eglin, though. <clears throat> Another thing, Highway 90 and the interstate runs right through the north side of Eglin. And them deer, them big bucks would get up there and lay right next to that interstate with that traffic, bumpity, bumpity, bump, yeah. going down the interstate. Mm. And you're down there on the other side of the road. There was a little strip, probably 200 yards wide in most places that they'd lay up there next to that interstate. And every once in a while, we'd run it and we'd kill some bucks out of it because yeah. they knew that we'd go down there on that big sections and run and they'd slip over there and lay up or go to the south side and get in the closed area and then we can't do nothing with them. Right. So you learn, I've had cousins that, and friends that used to hunt them closed areas. And they would go in there in them closed areas hunting these bucks and tote them out. <laughs> but they, would, they, they have actually watched them dogs be running deer into the closed area. And then bucks would get in the creek and get up there by some limbs or something and get in the water. Nothing but their eyes, their nose, and their horns up in them branches. And they watched the dogs come down and mill around down at the creek you yeah. cross the creek or go on and then they'd slip out i yeah. mean that that's uh, a that's a cool story my dad told me uh, a story similar to that where uh, when they were deer hunting running dogs um the the dogs got held up at this beaver pond if i remember the story right and uh my granddad went down there and was looking, and he could just barely see horns sticking up out of the water, and it was just the deer's nose. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Which you got to think that these deer will do, which I would do the same thing if I was being chased by something mm-hmm. that was wanting to kill me, or I thought was wanting to kill me. So they'll do anything. It's a survival instinct mm-hmm. uh, to hide as best as possible. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's just 
I, that's just what they do, you know. I mean, they hide the best, and they probably do some things that survival you would think. Yep, they probably do some things that you would think is crazy, but they'll do whatever it takes to survive. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a, a buck we were running. It was actually just north of the airport in Fort Walton. And we had shot this deer on the other side of the section. They'd done shot him like five times, had him bleeding good. We well, come down in the creek, and that creek crossed two power lines. Mm -hmm. Had about 50 yards of woods in between them. Well, we had our entire hunting party, about 30 people, surrounded each side of that creek. And me and two of my buddies, we were in the creek down, downstream. And we were watching wads of blood this big float by us. They said the deer come down the creek, crossed the first power line, the second power line, went into the woods, went back north, crossed both those power lines again, and got back in the creek trying to throw the dogs off. Yeah. Well, I wound up coming out of the creek, going back up there north of the power line, went through the woods to the creek to where I could hear the dogs baying the deer at, and I could see the deer splashing water out of the creek as he run back south. And they finally killed him when he come back out down there. But that deer had been shot 17 times. Oh, my And gosh. that race lasted over 25 minutes after his first shot was fired into him. Really? Good now, gracious. A, a deer that's like that, a mature buck. Yeah. That's in survival mode. He is hard to put down. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, you hear people talk about, well, I shot him. I know he said he's blowed the heart out of a deer before heart be laying on the ground. And they still run 150 yards. Yeah. They're dead on their feet. They, they just don't, don't know, know they're it. dead, but yeah. they're still moving. Right. Like you said, survival mode kicks in, and yeah. they just do whatever it takes. Yeah. Well, it was nice to meet y'all and have y'all on for sure. Y'all as well. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank y'all so I much. I enjoyed it, every bit of it. No problem. Absolutely. Thank y'all. Glad y'all yep. took the time to come over and Mr. talk Riley. to us. Glad, yeah, it's glad been interesting. Glad you shared it. I've always wanted to hear the story myself ever since I've, <laughs> ever since I've seen the pictures on Facebook. Matter well, of fact, I was probably one of them people looking at it whenever you were sitting at the store eating your sandwich. Probably. <laughs> probably. I think we all were. Uh, yeah. And thank you again uh, for opening up your home to us to come in here and yes, record not this. Not a problem yes. at all. Uh, glad y'all took the time to come over and sit down with us. And I will say, too, um, you said earlier that you have so many spots that you can only put your butt in one, one of them. I'll... I'll take one for the team, and I will fill one of those spots if you ever need me to. Okay. He ain't giving those right. spots up so readily now. You could talk me into it. Well, I, I'm still negotiating my guide service price. Yeah. So when I get it settled, I'll let okay. you know. Well, we done got a few of your tricks now. Fair enough. Hey, yeah, But, <clears throat> but I've enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank y'all. Yep. Yes, Thank y'all again. and uh, We'll have to – if y'all are up for it, we'll have to get you back on and uh, talk some more deer hunting. Cause, cause <laughs> hey, this is, we can uh, always talk deer yeah, hunting. These are endless stories, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. We'll get a little better plan together and uh, maybe throw some kind of cookout in there, too. There we go. That'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We do, uh, good. we do a Dutch oven cook cast iron spring and fall, so we got one of them probably going to be coming up here before too long. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Okay. If y'all yeah. like good groceries, uh, oh, we can yeah. probably arrange some of that. Yeah, yeah sir. Yeah, yeah, you know Talon does when he walked in. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm, in, I'm, I'm good to you go got on a any. Cup? <laughs> yeah, I'm good to go on any food you got. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, food is my friend. <laughs> yep, yes, sir. That's right. Well, we'll end it here, and uh, thank you guys again, and uh, we'll end it here. All yeah. Right. Sounds All right. good. Sounds good.